Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Rung Week in Review for December 10, 2023. Today we're talking with Sergei Melkonian. Hello, Sergei. Welcome to the show. Welcome, Sergei. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. The so-called peace negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan resemble a roller coaster. While Pashinyan and his government are begging for peace, Aliyev frequently goes from praising Pashinyan to making threats against Armenia. And so it was this week when we were pretty sure that Aliyev had dumped the Western platform for negotiations, and we saw cancellations of high-level visits between the U.S. and Azerbaijan, and even warnings from the U.S. Then, then, like nothing has happened, Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, James O'Brien, visited Aliyev, and suddenly things appear to be on demand. Well, at least uh, what happened next was that Aliyev and Pashinyan issued a rosy joint press release with the following key points. Baku will release the two POWs and hostages. Armenia will release the two violent criminals it is known to keep. The foreign ministers will meet in Washington, D.C. Azerbaijan will support Baku's bid to host COP29 next year. It is a big climate conference, and it will drop its own candidacy. In fact, yesterday, December 11, Azerbaijan was selected as a site for next year's COP29 meeting. Azerbaijan will also support Armenia's candidacy for Eastern European Group COP Bureau membership. There was no discussion of the military political leadership of Artsakh or being held by Aliyev. Many of them have fought in the first war. Some of them are heroes of Artsakh. If anything, we read from Pashinyan that he has no plan or strategy for dealing with issues regarding Artsakh. Western countries, Iran, and even Turkey tripped over each other congratulate the sites, one of which committed a genocide just two months ago, I feel compelled to repeat, and welcome the so-called breakthrough in development of talks. Each week, the dose of humiliation served on Armenians seems to only increase. Sergei, what's your overall assessment of what happened here? What did Armenia concede this time and why? Okay. First of all, we should understand that it is Armenia that is interested in a peace deal, not Azerbaijan. Because Azerbaijan gets everything it wants without any peace deal. So Azerbaijan seized all Artsakh without any peace deal. Azerbaijan got Armenian recognition for Azerbaijani sovereignty over so-called enclaves that are in Tavush and Narat regions without any peace deal. Azerbaijan is getting communications uh, through Armenia without peace deal. Azerbaijan get the promise from current Armenian leadership about the return of so-called Western Azerbaijani community to Armenia without peace deal. So I mean, Aliyev is not interested in peace deal. Why does he need any paper that will limit himself if he can achieve all goals without any deal? At the same time, uh, current Armenian authorities, they're interested in a peace deal because this is their only agenda, their only regional, not regional, but globally, their foreign policy agenda, that we are so close to, to reach the peace in the South Caucasus. So, but we do not have the peace deal So, So it means that Armenian government try to show that we are really so close, and such statement is one of indicators of that. And I would disagree a bit that this joint statement is a part of whole peace deal process. First of all, there is nothing about the most important issues that are discussing during the negotiation process. The limitation demarcation problem, communications, then establishing of diplomatic relations, etc., etc. So there is and some security guarantees. So there is nothing in this joint statement. As far as we know, this joint statement, I mean, the content of this joint statement was reached during meetings between the head of Armenian Security Council, Armin Grigorian, and Aliyev's advisor on foreign policy, Hikmet Gaji. This uh, meeting was also facilitated by the West. And as you mentioned, Hovik, this statement was released after O'Brien's visit back. So this statement is a bit sidestep from the whole general negotiation process. The problem is where should two sides continue their negotiation? So there are three options. 
West, Russia, and direct negotiations on Armenia-Azerbaijan border. Armenia prefers Western platform because all last agreements were reached in, or in Brussels or in Prague or in uh, Granada or in DC, etc. Alice prefers direct negotiations or negotiations in Moscow or in 3 plus 2 format because everything that was possible to get from the Western platform, he already got that. So there is no need of the Western platform for Azerbaijan. For Armenia, situation is more complicated. Armenia has nothing to promote on 3 plus 2 or in Moscow platform. Aliyev's, as I saw when I was in Moscow, Aliyev's experts, they try to find stakeholders. What does it mean? According to point 0.9 November 10, 22 statement, joint trilateral statement, Armenia should provide a communications via SUNIC uh, from Azerbaijan, from Artsakh occupied territories that are un under Azerbaijani control to Nakhijuan. We all like we understand that this trilateral statement is not relevant anymore as Artsakh physically does not exist. So, Malali, he should get uh, the so called Zangzur corridor. And he's trying to involve Russian side that is interested in its presence over the communications. Because if uh, negotiations will be continued on the Western platform, there won't be mentioned any type of Russian presence or joint Armenian Russian control over, over communications. But if negotiations continue on Moscow or in, in 3 plus 2 format, there will be Russian presence. So from Armenian perspective, it's important to avoid being involved in some Russia, Iran, led platforms and continue negotiations on the Western one. So this is the problem that we have today. At the same time, uh, we see that there is no real political will from the West to use any tools against Azerbaijan to bring it back on Western platform. Uh, at the same time, we have a political will from the West to more empower Armenia to provide some security guarantees. Like, for example, we got an update about um, the enlargement of EU monitoring mission. But I mean, these are not guarantees because this is not enough. At the same time, they are not ready to make pressure on other countries. At least diplomatically, as O'Brien was doing, they try to send some signals to Azerbaijan that you should come back and continue negotiation on our platform. So this is the situation that we are now. And I don't believe that the so-called peace deal is we can reach soon. Uh, at least uh, that there are several reasons. And that, the, as I mentioned, the most important, Azerbaijan is not interested in any peace deal because Azerbaijan, till today, it calls Armenia Western, uh, Western Azerbaijan. And if you talk with some uh, Aliyev's expert, they yeah. try to not use any uh, Armenian toponyms, hydronyms, or, or they also try to avoid uh, using Armenia. They use Western Azerbaijan, they use uh, Western Zangizu. So, I mean, this is the government-led new discourse. And it means that they are not ready for, for any real peace deal. And the second argument, the new snap elections in, in Azerbaijan that should took place on February next year. So, it means that it's quite not realistic having a peace deal before elections. So uh, the main goal of Aliyev is to preserve like the status quo that he changed in 2023. And based on this status quo, again, get from 80 to 90% during this election. So this is why he's not interested, at least in a short-term perspective. Sergey, the sides made sure uh, to mention that this deal was reached bilaterally between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan to release Armenia hostages. However, the release seemed to be suspiciously uh, coincidental with O'Brien's visit. Uh, in fact, the entire sort of episode of O'Brien's visit is pretty funny considering all that the U.S. was uh, talking about officially, uh, whether it's the statements that the U.S. won't tolerate uh, any aggression against Artsakh, or you know, it won't be, be there won't be any going back to business as usual. Uh, what do you think was discussed between U.S. and Azerbaijan? Who caved and for what? And there is no clear understanding what exactly was discussing during uh, the meeting between O'Brien and Aliyev. But as you mentioned, for example, 
couple of days before Azerbaijan inauguration and that incident that took place in September this year, a U.S. officially stated that this is a red line. But he, when Azerbaijan crossed the, this red line, there was no any reaction from the U.S. So it means that or there is no political will or there is no relevant tools to use against Azerbaijan. The same is with the EU. For example, in EU, there was adopted a statement according to which what happened in September was an ethnic incident. But there was no any sanction or any unilateral uh, some decisions against Azerbaijan. So it, and Azerbaijan said that, okay, if someone from Brussels or from DC uh, state that this is red line, but I'm crossing the, the red line, so there is no any negative reaction. So it means that there is no real red line, so I can continue crossing. Uh, but as far as I understand, like the most important message from the West to 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 Aliyev is no guy. This time Armenian territory is a real red line. But the problem is what are you going to do if Azerbaijan continues to cross the, this red line? So for example, Aliyev still occupies at least 220 squares of Armenian territory, Armenian sovereign territory that has nothing with with Nagorno Karabakh. So as far as I understand, so this was the most important message that we are uh, ready to keep at least this red line, but it's unclear how they are going to keep this red line. Speaking of red lines, we know that another one that the U.S. presented to Azerbaijan was the uh, so-called bypass of the Zangezur corridor, uh, which Azerbaijan and Turkey want to accomplish by building a railway through Iran. The U.S. has warned Azerbaijan against doing this. And what do you think will be the outcome of this uh, project? You know, do you think that this uh, issue of the Zangezur corridor bypass through Iran uh, was brought up? I'm not sure that something was changed because, let's clarify, so this communication, it existed for a long time. So there is nothing new. The only new is the railway component. I mean, Azerbaijan was also was always using this transport route to reach Nakhijevan through Iran. But as Iranian colleagues told me, uh, that that was Iranian agenda in order to reduce political and military pressure from Turkey and Azerbaijan against Armenia. This is why they put on the agenda the new railway component. And from U.S. perspective, it means that Iran gets more leverage on the process on the South Caucasus, on Armenia, on Azerbaijan. And for sure, this is mm, against U.S. interests in the region. So this is why, as you mentioned, there were some signals from the U.S. that this is not the best way to involve Iran in communications. But the problem is, for example, they do not pay attention to North-South route. The more than 70% of trade turnover over through North-South route is moving through Azerbaijan. And Russia is investing in Resht Astara part of the railway that should be finalized in 2025. It means Azerbaijan will be the key transitor in the frame of within the North-South transport corridor. And what is interesting, uh, Iran is finalizing free, its free trade zone agreement with Eurasian Economic Union. So it means that there is Eurasian Economic Union Russia, there is Iran that has to free change the zone agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union, and there is Azerbaijan. So it means that they will try to engage somehow Azerbaijan in Eurasian Economic Union cooperation based on also on this north-south route that will have that Azerbaijan will be the has will have some exclusive position in this case because only Azerbaijan will have a railway component of north-south route in the South Caucasus. So from the U.S. perspective, I think that will be more will be more relevant to stop Azerbaijan being engaged in some cooperation in this direction. Sergey, as you mentioned earlier, and most analysts have on our podcast also been unanimous that a peace deal on paper is not going to actually mean anything if Azerbaijan is not negotiating in good faith. And in fact, last week Aliyev did what he usually does. He's always moving the goalposts. So he made some verbal clarifications to the Azeri position on peace. He highlighted that just because an Armenian-Azeri treaty is signed, it doesn't mean that actual peace will take place. 
So, you know, there may be a treaty, but Aliyev is not really committed to this peace. Specifically, he pointed out that Azerbaijan must have guarantees, perhaps outside the scope of the treaty, that Armenia will never again pose a threat to Azerbaijan. He complained about France and India providing arms to Armenia and said that those actions are a provocation. And once the level of arms becomes a threat, Azerbaijan will be forced to act. One thing to add to that, the following day, Erdogan, on his way back from a visit to Greece, also announced that Armenia must not be armed. Yeah. Are Azerbaijan and by logical extension, Turkey, honest partners in the negotiations with Armenia for peace? I mean, how do the Turkish sides envision an Armenia that will forever be, quote unquote, peaceful for them? Okay, there was also one precondition for the peace deal from Malaya. Armenia should reject any revanchism in its foreign policy. So what does it mean? Who are revanchists from Azerbaijani and Turkish perspective? Uh, that, that's clear, because they mentioned it like uh, public vocally. From Aliyev's perspective, revanchists are represented by Armenian opposition. Because during the process that took place in Armenia, Aliyev stated that if such uh, forces will come back to power, we should forget a, a, about any peace because these are these guys are revanchists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. From Turkish perspective, revanchists, major revanchist is Armenian diaspora. And Mevlush Çavuşoglu, a previous head of Turkish MFA, he stated that until Armenia has such diaspora, it's impossible to reach peace with Armenia. Yeah, that's right. So it means that any diaspora and any opposition involvement, uh, not even in decision making, but in internal uh, social and political process, should be avoided by current Armenia. Otherwise, that will be considered from Turkey and Azerbaijan as a revanchist attempt. So it means that we should keep all opposition in jail. We should ban EU sanction against our diaspora that would like to come to Armenia, etc., etc. The second point, it means, as Armenian officials stated before, that any Artsakh Republic institution presence in Armenia is a threat to Armenia. And any uh, meetings, any official statements, also threat for I Armenia. Mean, they label it as a as a bomb or something like that. So it means that you should forget about our stuff, you should forget about symbols, you should block your opposition, you should block your diaspora, and you should stop arming yourself. Because in Turkey and in Azerbaijan, they understand that until Armenians are a little bit armed, they might be a threat for that. But the threat in case of self-defense, because why they were so afraid that uh, there is NK defense army still in Artsakh? Because they understand that until there is a weapon, Armenians are ready to resist. So they are no, they are not going to give up. But if Armenia doesn't have even a small opportunity to to resist, they will give up as we are doing. I mean, last for last three years at least. Mm -hmm. So this is their perspective. We should keep Armenian weak. And Ali also said, that, for example, Armenian population should not be more than five or six million. Right. Armenia should not procure new weapon and military munition, etc., etc. So it means that we would like to fix, uh, to record on the paper, the new power balance that was created after September 2023. And that's it. So they do not want to have any shift in the power balance because otherwise they will understand that there will be Armenians that will never forget about our Tsar Republic. They will try to get back their homes, etc., etc. And from their perspective, of course, this is a threat for them. This is why they will try to uh, use all tools, tools to frame, to limit all any opportunities to make Armenians strong again. Sergey, do you think there is any relationship between these uh, topics which you just mentioned and the fact that over the past few years, civil contract, the ruling party, has invested so little in the Armenian armed forces and has invested much more in the police? Uh, that's another topic for discussion because for me, that's it's, it's not unclear. It's clear why, for example, some police servicemen, uh, salary is uh, higher than uh, guys' salary that are standing on the front line. Mm -hmm. We see different approach towards Armenian security. For example, the number of policemen increase we see like new divisions, new departments, etc. But the policy towards uh, regarding our military forces, we got some statements like, if you want to avoid your military service, 
you should just pay some money for a budget and you are welcome. So what does it mean? We do not have even enough soldiers today to keep all our front line. But if, for example, they adopt some decision that you can, using money or some uh, some other goods, avoid your service from the military, so we will won't we will have less military service now. So we will focus now. Our main focus more on internal security rather than external one. So yeah, and this this trend is is it clear for me? Coming back to the humiliating swap of uh, criminals for hostages. Azerbaijan is known for uh, holding much more than the 32 prisoners of war that were announced, with the prime example being the military political leadership of Artsakh, including Ruben Vartanian, Bako Sahakian, Arkadzi Hukasian, General Levon Manasakanian, General David Manukian, and more, whom Azerbaijan clarified that they won't be released. In reality, the number of hostages that Azerbaijan officially acknowledges holding is more than 50, while Armenian human rights activists say that they have proof of many more Armenians who were at one time in Azerbaijani custody, and the latter is simply withholding information about them. So the deal that they struck involves the release of only 32 POWs that uh, Azerbaijan is holding, uh, and in exchange, Armenia will release two brutal Azeri criminals who infiltrated Armenia in 2022 and killed a peaceful Armenian citizen. Uh, these guys are probably Azeri intelligence officers, spies, but they are surely not prisoners of war. There was no war when they sneaked into Armenia and murdered an Armenian. They're genuine Romil Safarovs. So my question is, with the leadership of Artsakh still being held hostage, among all the other hostages that are currently there, and apparently no remaining prisoners in Armenia to trade them with, what will be the fate of the military political leadership of Artsakh? That's a really complicated question because I don't have an answer. I don't know what will be the future of our heroes of our political leadership that are in jail in Baku now, because as far as I understand, at least Armenia doesn't do anything. We have, according to Sianur Sarkan, as you mentioned, we have more than 50 proved POWs but also, uh, according to different information, number of POWs might be more than 100. Aliyev released only part of them, maybe also to strengthen the current authorities' position, because they promised that they will bring back our guys. Maybe the next part of our POWs will be released uh, during snap elections might take place in Armenia, I mean, right before elections, to to play on on the current authority side. I don't know about the future of our leadership because it's not on the agenda of Armenian foreign policy at all. No one cares, I mean, from officials. No one cares, at, the, at least on the level of NGO. There are some several NGOs, but those non-government organizations were defending human rights in Armenia before, before 2018. They're inactive now. Why? Because most of them, they're or affiliated with the government or the part of the government of Armenia. And they do not put this problem on the agenda because this is a real problem from their perspective in Armenia and Azerbaijan reconciliation. So they will try to avoid anything related to Artsakh because from their perspective, like they surrounded Artsakh and that's it, so let's forget about it. And everything connected with Artsakh, we should forget. This is, I mean, th th that's for sure, this is clear agenda to avoid anything, to block anything related to Artsa, because this might create a new obstacle towards the peace deal. Sergey, the November 10th statement talks about the exchange of POWs. That is the only positive pro-Armenian point in that. International law is clear about it, that you're not supposed to use POWs as bartering chips. You are supposed to return them as soon as hostilities are over. Yet, Azerbaijan just ended up having so many POWs that it is always releasing a few and uh, earning points, whether it's praise from international community or whether it's some kind of a concession from Armenia. Just last week, Pashinya was talking about the principle of all for all. That is the only principle that is to be uh, observed when talking about uh, exchanging POWs. And what happened? Why are we in a situation where everyone in the international community, 
uh, is willing to turn a blind eye towards this. Olujan, uh, who does care about POWs? Like, who cares about ethnic cleansing that took place in Artsakh? Who cares about thousands of children that are killing until today in Gaza? I mean, in the case of unproportional use of force. So we see that if you do not care, no one will care about it. If Armenian government, if Armenia today does not care about our POWs, if we do not push forward this agenda on international platforms, if we do not care about our heroes and political military leadership that are in jail in Baku, no one will care. If uh, the same is with uh, self-defense, if you are not ready to defend yourself, no one will invest. Like when we had previous conversation, I, I get an example with Ukraine. Like if Ukraine stops its policy towards Russia, uh, if Ukraine stops war, no one will invest in Ukraine. Like why they should invest in Ukraine if Ukraine is not ready to deter Russia? The same with, with Armenia. Previously, we got support because we were ready and we were deterring Azerbaijan. So we got this support. But if today our like we did a U-turn from this strategy, so we won't find anyone who will invest in Armenia that is not ready to deter Turkey or is ready to deter Azerbaijan. Uh, vice versa, Armenia is ready to be part of a Turkish sphere of influence to unblock communications with Turkey and Azerbaijan, not with Georgia or Iran, for example. Because according to this crossroads of peace, our top priorities are communications between Turkey and Azerbaijan, not between Iran and Russia. So that no one will invest in, in such Armenia. Maybe those who are interested in, for example, spreading Turkish zone of influence and deterring Russia and Iran. Okay, in this uh, configuration, obviously we will get some support. So we will really get this support. As you mentioned earlier, Sergei, in the middle of these negotiations, Ilham Aliyev has called for early presidential elections to be held in just two months on February 7, 2024, instead of the originally planned October 2025. Most analysts and observers are not aware of the reasons for holding such snap elections in Azerbaijan. But interestingly, just last week, we were talking with Benjamin Boosian, and he noted that Azeri society will not remain in a state of post war euphoria for very long. So Aliyev needs to come up with new schemes to keep his society in a in a nationalistic fervor and keep himself in power. What do you attribute Aliyev's rush to get reelected now? Uh, and one more quick note on my part. Well, I say reelected and we call him president, but Aliyev is neither elected nor a president. He's a dictator and yeah, everyone just appeases him because of the energy resources in Azerbaijan. So they call him a president. Yeah, this is the re-election of Aliyev. He has nothing to do with right. re-elections. Um, first of all, all major elections that definitely will have an impact on, I mean, not only regional, but global geopolitics, will take place next year. Elections, re-elections in Russia, elections in the EU, and elections in the US. Mm -hmm. So it means that First, Aliyev needs to have stronger position before all other elections will take place. Second, for Aliyev, it's extremely important to record this success before 2025. Because in 2025, Azerbaijani society will demand some new stuff from Aliyev. Why we are poor? Why, for example, we do not have still more than 100,000 Azerbaijanis living in Artsakh? Why we do not have more than 100,000 Azerbaijanis that are living in Sunni, etc., etc. And in 2025, it will be more complicated to get the same result as it may reach, for example, it may reach next year. So it's important to record the success until it's possible. Third, the peace deal. Until Azerbaijan is preparing for elections, then will be post-election process. There is no any reason to sign a peace deal because Aliyev has a justification of that. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm a little bit busy, so, okay, let's discuss some. Let's have some peace talks, and we do not need any such negotiation that may have some negative impact, etc., etc. And fourth, but less relevant, in a midterm run, Aliyev understand that maybe he should sign an peace deal. 
and to sign such agreement is to get some internal legitimacy. Because all snap elections that took place, I mean, in the, such uh, dictatorships as in Azerbaijan, to get internal and external legitimacy. It's only legitimacy they should get for some new war, like to unify society around Aliyev, like to try to bring Azeri flag in the Erevan or in Goris or in Seva, or to sign a peace deal. I think take into account all new emerging Azerbaijan narrative about Western Azerbaijan, I think the first scenario is more relevant than the second one. Hmm. And Aliyev also will get some historical new achievement. For example, they will say that first time during 30 years, Azerbaijan elections took place in Nagorno-Karabakh, etc., etc. So he will try to capitalize all possible stuff after 2023. Yeah. Uh, switching topics, uh, Sergei, Russia was one of the last countries to, quote, congratulate, uh, unquote, the sides uh, on the prisoner swap deal. Uh, and in general, the, uh, you know, the announcement. The Russian-Armenian relationship remains a major concern for us, as it seems that the Pashinyan administration is talking about allied directions with Russia uh, from one side of its mouth, but from the other is, is or essentially is walking in a completely different direction. Uh, at stake is Armenia's membership in the CSTO, the EAEU, the CIS, uh, Russia's military base in Armenia, uh, are the favorable energy prices that Armenia is getting, uh, 50% of Armenia's exports go to Russia, uh, and essentially a third of the economy is tied to Russia in one way or another. Uh, so all those issues are at stake, uh, but many believe that the genie is out of the bottle now in terms of uh, the future of Russian-Armenian relations, uh, because Russian officials even uh, at the official level are taking pot shots uh, at Armenian uh, officials and vice versa. Even at the level of analysts and experts, it seems like there is more uh, acknowledgement that the relationship is in very dire straits. For instance, uh, even Stanislav Tarasov, who normally is pro-Armenian, uh, recently said that, you know, essentially Armenia is at a dead end without any partners left. Um, so, and, and as, as we mentioned, Sergey, you just came back from Russia. Uh, did you talk mm-hmm. to anyone there in terms of in the analyst community? Tell us what you heard. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there were several close round tables with the Russian scholars, experts, with also some other Majani experts. So in Russia, there are two perspectives. First, Armenia didn't cross some strong red line. For example, still we have military base, still our still our border troops are in Armenia. Armenia still still is a member of CS2. Armenia is a member of Eurasian Economic Union, CIS, etc., etc. So everything is fine from this perspective. What is taking place is not so important because there is no real any discussion to CS2, etc. So we we should we can be calm a bit. The second perspective they focus on on trend. Okay, guys. Yes, Armenians are still member of these organizations, but. What Armenia is doing now, Armenia is trying to create a parallel a security system that is provided by the West. For example, Armenia has a Russian troops on Armenia, Turkish and Armenia Iran border. Fine. Now Armenia will have EU troops on Armenia Azerbaijan border, and the number will increase. Now Armenia has security cooperation with France, with India, and will have with the EU. And U.S., we got some signals that the U.S. is also ready to continue cooperation and security dimension with Armenia. So the first group, I will try to separate them into groups. The first group, they try to uh, show that everything is fine. But as far as I understand, these guys are also responsible for Russian foreign policy strategy towards our Caucasus. That's why for them it's important to show that everything is fine for decision makers. The second group, they are more independent and they are free in their expression to uh, trying to explain that what is really going on on the ground. But uh, some important things, for, for me at least, uh, the most important thing that 
Armenia still is in a group of friendly country. What does it mean? Yes, we are dependent from Russia in economy, in energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's not as from as I understand. It's not coming from Russia. It's also coming from Armenia. Okay, we have, for example, until the end of this year, we'll have more than two million tourists in Armenia. But more than one million of them are coming from Russia. What is the problem to bring some other tourists? So this is not Russia who paying its tourists to come to Armenia. No, this is, I mean, this is natural process that's going on. Next, 52% of, percent of Armenian exports goes to Russia. What was the problem to try to reach European markets? What was the problem to try to reach, for example, Indian markets? So yes, there are clear limitations. This is why we have, for example, Russia is a more, as a market that has more comfortable uh, environment for Armenian goods. And so on. So all our important indicators are directly connected with Russia. But Russia does not insist like, no, you should have more than a half tourists only from Russia. There the, are no such statements. Or you should bring more than half of your experts to Russia. No, this is business. If you as a business see that EU market is better rather than the Russian, please go to the EU market. But the problem is, Why we do not have, for example, at least 10% trade turnover with EU, 20%. Because, for yeah. example, we see that the trade turnover with, with Russia increase and the trade turnover with the EU decrease according to this year. So this is not coming from Russia, it's coming from Armenia. If you are ready for a diversification, no problem, guys. Try. The, 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 I mean, this is not the uh, Russian. We will not punish Armenia if we will sell more, for example, Armenian wine in Hungary or somewhere else. Please do that. The problem is we see that this is not possible, at least at least now. So Hungary does not yes. need such Armenian wine that the Russian market needs. And they are not against. So the most important point for me was we are still friendly. It means that Russia is not There is no any political decision against Armenia to punish somehow, etc. Because imagine that one day Russia will decide to punish Armenia in economy, in energy, etc., etc., etc. At least in the short term run, that will be disaster for us. Right. This is not good. This is not bad. This is a fact. Okay, and and they are not uh, against of any diversification. So military cooperation with India, they are fine. Armenia signed a, an agreement with the UK, they're also fine. They are not fine only with the fact that in case of any cooperation will be aimed against Russia. They are fine with all diversification. They are fine with uh, respons sharing responsibility. If someone is ready to share uh, guarantees in Armenian security or Armenian economy, they are fine with that. But If this cooperation is aimed against Russian interests, like with Rome statute, that is for Russian is still unclear, like from their perspective, okay, guys, you see that uh, international court of justice uh, was not able to punish Azerbaijan. Okay, they adopted a decision uh, that the blockade of Lachin corridor is illegal, and Azerbaijan should unblock Lachin corridor. Then Azerbaijan seized the ONK and organized the ethnic cleansing. So International Court of Justice did not do anything. At the same time, you are going to ratify the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court. And you state that we are using legal tools against Azerbaijan. Okay, guys, but you see that these legal tools are not working against Azerbaijan. But this International Criminal Court just adopted a decision that Vladimir Putin should be arrested, etc., etc. Why you are ratifying that you are not getting anything The same time you are going and iterating relation with your ally, like it was complicated to explain them, because from their perspective this was an unfriendly act because it's it does not come from Armenian interest, because it was complicated to explain how does it come from Armenian interest, like legal tools are not working, but we will continue to try to reach more legal tools. So yeah. and from their perspective, until Armenia acts against Russia, so this is unacceptable. But if Armenia cooperates with like everyone to make it self-sufficient in security, etc., etc., they are totally fine with that. I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, I see uh, the reports about 
huge lines in loves. Um, and this is just being talked about as a minor slap on the wrist for Armenia if it chooses to cross Russia in reality. Talking about uh, the you know Armenia securing new potential markets for its products is nonsense because we know that uh, even the EU, for instance, would be the candidate for this. Uh, they have strong protection both in terms of safe st- safety standards and um, just market protection for EU countries uh, against cheap foreign imports. So, so if that's just a slap on the wrist, and uh, then what will be the state of Armenia's economy uh, and the state of Armenia's relations with Russia if things continue this way? Yesterday we were, we talked a bit with Azbed about what's happening in. Uh, Armenian, Georgian, Georgian, Russian border with Armenian goods. First of all, just, just to make it clear, Armenia and Russia always violate the standards that were set by both sides. But the problem is, if previously, for example, Russians did not pay attention if some Armenian producers they violate some standards, now they started to pay attention. The same is with the Armenian side. Second. Such measure was a kind of, as I told us, but a kind of invitation for a dialogue. So this is not a tough tool against Armenia, not yet. But as a pre-New Year period, when Armenian uh, businessmen try to reach as effective as possible Russian market, yeah, that might be a bit sensitive. But in general, that's a kind of invitation. Of, okay, please come to St. Petersburg and let's have a meeting to try to understand where our relations are going. What about uh, Armenian anti-Russian sentiments? As far as I understand, Armenia can rely on Western support until Armenia uh, continues to do any anti-Russian sentiments, at least sentiments, if not steps. Like with Ukraine, until Ukraine is hostile towards Russia, it will get support. The same as with Armenia and with Georgia. Until we are ready to deter Iran and we are ready to deter somehow Russia to uh, make some vocal anti-Russian sentiments, we'll get this support, as far as I understand. Uh, they we stop do that, we won't get any support. I mean, with the West in general. But for example, our cooperation with France is not based on this uh, logic. Because the France, there was no any precondition from France that you should blame Russia and everything. You should stop. Uh, you should leave CSTO. You should do that. You should do that. Only after that we will cooperate with you. No, there was not such precondition, at least from France. But uh, the roots of anti-Russian sentiments are coming from this policy that Armenia is conducting today. From this government, basically. Yeah, I mean this government. Yeah. yeah. Sergey, you just mentioned Ukraine. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what's going on over there. After nearly two years of gruesome fighting and hundreds of thousands of casualties, the war in Ukraine seems to be reaching some kind of a a conclusion. The last chance counteroffensive by Ukraine earlier this year is now a real failure. Russia will have the initiative next, and even the Western press are now openly talking about a Ukrainian defeat. Certainly, Western military aid for Ukraine is starting to slow down. This past week, Republicans in the U.S. Congress blocked over $61 billion in aid for Ukraine. Uh, And even though we think that's more related to in-house partisan bickering uh, more than Ukraine, the slowing down of aid is clearly evident. We frequently talk about the fact that the new world order is going to depend heavily on how the war in Ukraine is resolved. What's your assessment about how this war is being conducted? Um, what, what outcomes do you see? And how do you see these affecting the South Caucasus when we get there? Okay. Uh, it's complicated to outline the future world order, or at least power balance. But um, some things are clear for me. First, there is no real political will in EU or in the US to invest more in Ukraine in order to deter Russia. Second, at least in 2024 and next year, as I mentioned, EU and US will focus more on internal problems because there will be elections. They will try to play somehow Ukrainian card, but according to all surveys, 
U.S. citizens and EU citizens, they're interested more on internal problems, migration, rates, etc., etc. So it justifying a new billion dollar package of assistance to Ukraine will be complicated. But it doesn't mean that Russian counteroffensive, yes, we see that Russia has some a bit success at least on three directions in Ukraine now. But it doesn't mean that Russia has capacity to launch its own counteroffensive to reach Kiev or to reach Odessa, etc. etc. Right. But it from this perspective, I mean Russian's strategy to make have a short-term war, have a, to involve Ukraine in a short-term war, to like nullify any capabilities of Ukraine to deter, will make Ukraine weaker and will bring a new agreement based on Ukrainian unilateral concessions. Uh, what are these concessions? Nobody knows, but we know that uh, there are some negotiations, uh, direct negotiations between some Ukraine and you know, Russia. At the same time, we see some we have some indicators from the West that uh, they are also pushing Ukraine uh, to have negotiations. Why? Because today, for Ukraine, it's possible to get more favorable deal rather than, for example, in a one-year run or in two-year run. So this this position for Ukraine might be better than it might be in two years. How it will affect on the South Caucasus? Uh, it's quite complicated. Uh, at least we know that number of Russian military servicemen will increase from the next year 470,000, if I'm not mistaken. So Russia will have more military. This military, if they reach peace, the Russian military uh, won't be involved deeply in an active conflict. It means that Russian military tools to ensure its security might be relevant again, and also they can use on the South Caucasus. Uh, what does it mean from for the West, from for at least for the US? Now there is a lot of sources to support Israel. Uh, next year, probably they will spend more resources to support Taiwan. Then they, they will maybe spend some resources to uh, support U- Ukraine just to restore what was what will happen with their economy. So Russia, in this case, will be in more favorable position to push forward its agenda on post-Soviet space and beyond. Uh, Sergey, the uh, regardless of the outcome of you know the Ukraine war, is there any chance that the West's relations with Russia will improve? For instance, uh, if there's any ceasefire signed. Uh, does that mean that uh, sanctions will be removed? Uh, I know that Europe will still need to buy Russian gas through Azerbaijan. Uh, Russia will still put great value in its link with India and the East through Azerbaijan and Iran, as it's doing right now with the rushed Astara rail pro- uh, project. Uh, so, uh, specifically with re- with regard to relations with Armenia and what Armenians can expect. Um, can we expect more of the same policies that are uh, detrimental to Armenia or at least neutral to Armenian interests, uh, even if the hot co- portion of the conflict is over? Or can this signify some change uh, where uh, you know more pro-Armenian policies by Russia will be uh, implemented? Okay. If, for example, we have peace deal between Russia and Ukraine, uh, there might be also reconciliation between at least between EU or German and France and Russia, uh, in order to avoid U.S. involvement, I mean, from Russian perspective. Uh, reconciliation between EU and Russia means that possibly, and I'm not sure, EU will remove any sanctions because Russian economy, foreign economic strategy, foreign policy strategy, they already did a U-turn towards Asia, India, China, Iran, etc., etc. Maybe some sectors that are still important for Russian economy, maybe Russia will insist on removing sanctions on this on this point. But in general, at least in the short term, uh, I do not see any real collapse of the Russian economy or something else. Like to, to, to make it clear, prices, I mean, in, in Moscow supermarkets, like goods are cheaper rather than the other one, the other one supermarkets. The same is with the rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is no collapse, and I'm not. I don't know which kind of points would be more important for Russia in case of 
removing the sanctioned regime coming to Armenia. It's important to understand that uh, 20% of economic growth that Armenia recorded last year was also thanks to sanctions against Russia. Like uh, the same case with Georgia, the same case is with Kazakhstan, the same case is with uh, other countries that continue their cooperation in economy with Russia. So if, for example, in case of Russia, we'll get direct access to the goods that I coming from Armenia now, Armenia will not uh, record any growth in economy. Uh, I will give you an example. The real sector of Armenian economy, that there is no growth. For example, agriculture was around 1%. Our uh, manufacturing was minus 0.2% or something like that. I mean, this real sector economy, there is no any growth. The whole growth coming from tourists, coming from making Armenia transit route between East and Russia. Re-exporting. Yeah, re-exporting, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, if we are talking about the outcome of possibly West Russia reconciliation in case of uh, end of Ukraine war, uh, we will lose possibly our positions in, in the Russian market now that we are benefiting from, at least for today. Second, I'm not sure that after end of Ukraine war, Russian policy towards Armenia will be pro, more pro-Armenian because also pro-Armenian, once Armenian Russian foreign policy comes from Armenian foreign policy towards Russia or towards the West. So it depends also uh, which kind of foreign policy strategy will Armenia conduct after the end of Ukraine war. But definitely, yes, uh, Russia will have more leverage on Azerbaijan that it can use in order to uh, keep it from uh, attacking Armenia. That's for sure. All right. Uh, Let's wrap our topics here. It's time to ask each of you if there's something on your mind that you would like to discuss from this past week. Hovig, anything you would like to share with us? Ofsted, uh, on Sunday, December 10, was the day's second anniversary of the day of the referendum uh, that established the independence of Artsakh in 1991. As painful as things are today, I strongly believe in remembering these dates and celebrating them uh, because it gives us an opportunity to remember the statehood of Artsakh, to celebrate the state of Artsakh, and to plant our future steps that will help us Return to Artsakh. Yes, you heard me right. And uh, I believe that uh, is only possible with perseverance, with hope, with the right vision and the right leadership. But it all begins with each one of us holding Artsakh in our hearts and in our minds. So happy December 10, everyone. May our return to Artsakh come soon. Keep the spirit alive. Sergei, what's on your mind? I'm convinced that this day will come, as I always write uh, in the end of my uh, posts, Ajortali Shushu, because I am convinced that everything is possible, even comparing like geography quickly, it's 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 really possible to bring everything back. We shouldn't overestimate Azerbaijan. Before we were underestimating, now we are overestimating them. We should continue our military build up. We should build alliances and we should change internally, change ourselves internally in order to outline the real priorities in security, in foreign policy and economy. And in this case, we will find new allies, we will find new partners that are interested in uh, making Artsakh Armenian again. All right. Thank you. We'll leave it there for today. Thank you, Sergei, for coming on our show. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Sergey John. Thank you for invitation and conversation. Merci, Shad. All right, that was our show, and it was recorded on December 12, 2023. We've been talking with Dr. Sergey Melkonyan, who is an academic director at the Armenian Research Foundation. He served as an assistant to President of Armenia, Armen Sarkisian, on Russia and Middle East politics. Sergey is currently a research fellow at APRI Armenia and the Institute of Oriental Studies. He's also an assistant professor at Yerevan State University and the Russian-Armenian University. 
He is a co-founder of the Armenian Project NGO. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. Take care, and we'll talk to you next week.